Hi YouTube, this is meant to be uh, like an introduction to Mach's principle. For those not familiar, I'm going to try to explain it to them as simply as possible. So what is Mach's principle? You might have heard the name Mach before, Mach 1, Mach 2, Mach the uh, sound barrier. Um, so Ernst Mach, in addition to um, theorizing about the sound uh, barrier, the speed of sound, um, also did work with, uh, well, I, I don't know what this uh, would pertain to. It's kind of like uh, physics and philosophy, kind of. So uh, this is called Mach's Principle. It's probably what he's most known for in uh, among physicists, anyway. And so uh, I want you to imagine that you are an ice skater at night, and you're twirling around. And while you're twirling, you notice two things. Relative to you, the stars are spinning around. And two, your arms have this funny property where they want to fly out. We call that the centripetal acceleration. Now, Mach's principle is the idea that those two phenomena are not a coincidence. That your arms fly out because, relative to the background stars, you are spinning. Now, I looked at this and I thought um, this is a great synthesis of two phenomena that um, are obviously connected. I mean, it's common sense. We'll go, yes, of course this would be the case. But then I wondered with this example, like, where's the symmetry? Uh, it doesn't make sense that the background stars would dictate the foreground, this, uh, this rotating uh, ice skater and it's not the other way around so the ice skater's perspective um, the universe is rotating around it why doesn't it impart a centripetal acceleration on the background stars and I thought of that uh, for a while at first it didn't make sense uh, because like if say if you're rotating one time per second um, then that means that the universe is rotating one time per second let's say the background stars are 13 billion light years away. So uh, that means they're going 13 billion times 2 pi r, uh, you know, uh, uh, light years uh, per second. And that is way faster than the speed of light. Calculations are impossible. Um, so you can't really uh, calculate this centripetal acceleration. It's like beyond infinity or something. Um, so I was puzzled by this. I was like, on one hand, it makes so much sense. And yet, uh, I don't understand why there's no symmetry. And then I came back to the problem. I was like, what if, uh, what if the symmetry lies in the angular momentum? So now we have the rotating skater and we distribute it's, uh, the skaters, uh, m uh, momentum, uh, angular momentum to the whole universe. Um, and what we find is that if it's distributed across the mass of the entire universe, that the universe is very static. It's very close to being absolutely static. There is no um, centripetal acceleration. There are practically none. So uh, I wanted to take you on a diversion to kind of explain the concept of Mach's principle, just the, the depths of the, the concept. And uh, I wanted to answer the question, how is the inertial frame defined? And I think Mach's principle does a good uh, example of, uh, does, is, a, is a good um, way to uh, figure this out. So um, say you have a universe, right? That is, uh, that consists of just a ball. And you're a god in this universe, and you want to move the ball. So you go to move the ball, and you reach a problem. The idea that you can move this ball in any way is fallacious, because you need a reference by which to gauge its motion. It, without a reference, uh, the, the state of the ball's motion is undefined. You can say it's moving or at rest. It doesn't matter. They're all... They all mean the same thing in this scenario. Um, there, there is no distinction between movement and being at rest. 
Um, so you need a reference frame for there to be motion, for motion to have meaning. Um, and so uh, what I uh, what I suppose is that uh, what the uh, what the reference frame for motion is, or for for the inertial frame, is mass. So mass is the is how the inertial frame is defined in relation to mass. So I came up with this uh, other thought experiment. It's basically the same universe with the ball, but we just add in a donut around the ball. And this donut has 99% of the mass in the, the universe. It has 99% and the ball has 1%. And you go to rotate the, the donut. And what you find is that uh, a very peculiar thing. Um, you would expect because you rotated the donut that the donut will have the centripetal acceleration. It'll have a centripetal bulge um, indicating that it's rotating. But it doesn't have much of an, a centripetal bulge. It has little, but uh, the ball is the one that is centripetal um, bulging out. And the way I describe this is like Mach's principle is a democracy of matter in which every mass unit has a vote. So what's going on in this donut and ball scenario is that uh, the donut has 99% of the mass and every mass unit in the donut is voting to each other, we are fixed, we are fixed, we are fixed. And they're sending this vote out to the ball and the ball receives the boat, vote and it says, okay, according to the reference frame of the donut, we are spinning around. And because the donut consists of 99% of the mass, the ball receives a centripetal bulge, way more of the centripetal bulge. The important thing I wanted to introduce is that the, the ball also does the same thing to the donut. So the ball is saying, we are fixed, we are fixed, we are fixed relative to itself, and sends this perspective out to the donut. And the donut uh, receives this vote and uh, has a small centripetal bulge because the the number of votes is smaller. The, the, the ball has one vote and the donut has 99, so it would be in that proportion of which, how much the centripetal bulge uh, would, uh, would show. And so I wanted to take this to our universe. So we have a scenario of a spinning neutron star. And uh, the neutron star, relative to itself, is spinning, and it says, we are fixed, we are fixed. Uh, the, the, uh, the reference frames of the star, the, um, and it sends this reference frame to uh, the background stars. And the background stars say, okay, uh, from the perspective of this neutron star, uh, we are spinning around it, and it receives a centripetal acceleration away. Of course, the mass of a neutron star compared to that of the background stars or the whole universe not consisting of the neutron star is very tiny, tiny, tiny. It's very small. But the insight I had was if you had enough uh, rotating reference frames, you can create uh, an expansion much like the expansion of the universe. And I'm going to show you uh, something called the Astrophysics Playground. And now the Astrophysics Playground is a game I developed to demonstrate this principle of symmetry of angular momentum, or uh, Mach's principle operating on the assumption of symmetry of angular momentum. And I want you to pay close attention when I turn up Mach's constant, because uh, if you look at that expansion, what you are seeing is an omnicentric expansion. It is the same kind of expansion that uh, when physicists want to demonstrate the expansion of the universe, they use a balloon like this. And uh, the balloon has uh, little dots on it to represent stars. And they blow it up to demonstrate that that is like an omnicentric expansion. That's what they're trying to get through your head. There's an omnicentric expansion. 
And uh, you, you ignore the fact that this is a balloon because the balloon is not an omnicentric expansion. There's the center of the balloon and it's expanding outwards. You pretend that you're like living on the surface of the balloon. And you're, what you're concentrating on is the relationship between the stars. And that is an omnicentric expansion. And what you see in the astrophysics playground is an at omnicentric expansion. And that's one of the reasons why I think uh, I think physicists should pay close attention to, to this idea because uh, it seems to describe a lot. Um, it, not only does Mach's principle do a good job of explaining uh, the expansion of the universe just using baryonic ma matter, um, it also does a pretty good job of explaining uh, dark matter. Uh, well, a, an okay job because it only... Um, really explains one of the observed phenomenon of dark matter. It explains the rotation curve discrepancies, but does not explain gravitational lensing. Um, so, but the, but it does a very good job of explaining um, gravitational. Uh, it, it does a good, really good job of explaining the uh, the rotation curve discrepancies. Um, so I have to make it a prediction on behalf of Mox principle or else uh, it's not much use to anybody. Um, and the, the, uh, the prediction I want to make it regards rogue stars. Okay? And the, the way we understand rogue stars is that uh, they, they're, they're in like a galaxy, right? This, my hand represents a galaxy. And the rogue stars are in the center of the galaxy at first. They, they're tangentially ejected outwards from the center of the galaxy. They go on some trajectory and they're ejected outward. And that's the current understanding of what we have of rogue stars. The problem with that is that uh, some stars, if you, you see a, a type of star, maybe it lives for 12 million years or something, and we see it out here, and we determine that in order for it to get from the center of the galaxy to there, it would have taken 20 million years or something like that. And we say this star can't possibly exist. There's like some conundrum. Now, I think Mach's principle would uh, resolve this problem quite well. So, say you have a rotating neutron, a rotating uh, galaxy, and uh, it's rotating, it's rotating. And what Mach's principle would say is that uh, these aren't hypervelocity stars. That's very unlikely. It may be possible that there's a hypervelocity star, but the, the overwhelming likelihood is that there are subvelocity stars. So the galaxy is rotating, 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 and one of these stars just falls out the rotational frame of the galaxy. So let's say it's fixed relative to the background frame. And all these stars are voting, we are fixed, we are fixed, we are fixed. This is the star that's rotating around. And so this star receives that perspective of the galaxy and says, I must be rotating around the galaxy. So what it does is it uh, centripetally accelerates away from the center of the galaxy. And uh, so Mox Prince, whereas uh, GR would say, um, these stars have to come from the center of the galaxy. Mox Principle says they can happen anywhere in the galaxy. It doesn't matter. As long as they stop rotating as fast around the galaxy as the stars, um, it is possible to have uh, a rogue star that is centripetally accelerating away. So the prediction I make uh, regards redshift observations of the star. So after t time 1 to time t2, uh, we would observe a redshift. The shift would get redder. It would indicate that the star is accelerating away uh, from the galaxy. Whereas GR would uh, predict that these stars are decelerating, or they're coming back, they're accelerating back towards the center of the galaxy, or, <clears throat> yeah, back towards the galaxy. So they will be blue shifted. So Mox principle would say the stars will be red shifted after time of observation. And GR will say they're blue shifted. And that uh, pretty much uh, sums up uh, Mox principle as I understand it. It's uh, as, as far as I've been able to 
uh, get. Uh, there, there is uh, one thing that I wanted to bring up. I mentioned this hypothesis to a physicist, and he uh, he brought up a great point, a great question. He said, um, "So you're saying that the background stars are accelerating away? They okay, they have a centripetal force, so they must be rotating, right?" And I was like, yes. And he said, uh, okay, which direction is it rotating? And this is a point I wanted to make that the background stars don't have a reference frame by which to gauge the rotation. It's absolute. So um, it's not absolute. It, uh, it's, uh, they have no reference frame by which to gauge the rotation. Uh, so uh, it's, like it's undefined it's like the the scenario with the ball like uh it doesn't matter which uh frame of reference you have if they're di even if they're disagreeing they can disagree what matters is the centripetal acceleration is added to it um so the the background stars are Basically, it's like they're rotating around in every direction. Um, it's every perspective of stars within, you know, the universe saying, okay, you're rotating in this direction, you're rotating in that direction, you're rotating in this direction. And they all receive a centripetal acceleration, um, a resultant centripetal acceleration away from every one of these, I call them origins, um, like the expansion is uh, of the universe is multicentric, and every center, every center is a source of rotation. Um, that every rotation drives the expansion; it pushes everything around it away, and that's the way uh, Mach's principle, as I understand it, and I think I probably have one of the best understandings of Mach's principle, or uh, among the best of of this hypothesis, this the the way Mach's principle would operate if it did operate in this universe. I uh, studied probably this more than anyone on planet Earth, so I think maybe I don't know. Uh, there there might be a few people who have thought about this more than I have, but uh, I must be uh, at the top one percent ten. 10th of 1%, 99th percentile of people who have thought of Mox Principle for a very, very long time. So I was watching uh, what I was uh, was telling you guys, my uh, introduction to Mox Principle. It's more than an introduction, I think. But um, what I wanted to uh, uh, add uh, was when I was talking about how if you had enough frames of reference, if you have enough rotating frames of reference, um, you can create an expansion effect, much like the expansion of the universe. I wanted to add that there's a law that I came up with that the distribution of angular momentum dictates the expansion of the universe. And I call that the law of expansion. And I thought that was a crucial piece that uh, of this mock hypothesis that um, that I thought uh, was important and I wanted to get through. And uh, it seems odd every time I do a video like this or a presentation, I always leave out that part about the law of expansion and uh, I'll, I'll try to remember it. I, it always slips my mind uh, when I'm talking about this. Anyway, um, thank you so much for watching. I hope you found it insightful. Um, Please leave a comment below if uh, you have some idea about Mox Principle that you want to add or you have some question. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Um, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the video.